Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and to see so many people in the room um, this afternoon. I wanted to add another dimension to this uh, issue in addition to the um, potentially very uh, severe risks to human health and the local environment, and that is uh, the threat of contributing significantly to global climate change. And um, it's really timely uh, to talk about climate change with the failure yesterday of the um, Warsaw International Climate Negotiations round, um, and also with the release this fall of the fifth assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's a, um, an international process that involves many thousands of scientists from around the world in extensive review. and. Contrary to what one, one might read, including on the commentary pages of the Vancouver Sun, there is extremely strong consensus among the scientific community that uh, climate change is happening and that it, uh, human activity is at least a very significant contribution to that. Um, the fifth assessment report, which was released in late September, projected that if we don't change, if we continue on a business as usual trajectory, by the end of this century, the global climate will increase on average by four degrees Celsius. Now, that doesn't sound like very much. You know, the temperature in this room has probably fluctuated by that much since we came in. But the difference between the temperature today and the last ice age is just a little more than four degrees Celsius. So when we talk about the global climate change, uh, climate, that is a massive increase. The increase is likely to be, um, is projected to be much greater in the Northern Hemisphere, and in particular, the projections show that um, if we reach a four degrees Celsius increase on average across the planet, that will be eight degrees Celsius in Canada. Um, that will have significant impacts on our ecosystems. Imagine changing when the peak river flows are by 30 to 60 days in the Fraser River and what that would do um, to species that don't adapt that quickly. Um, but what's particularly troubling for me are the projections of how, um, how severe the impacts will be on um, the global south, uh, the, the developing world that has contributed the least to this problem. Um, it is projected that sea level rise will be greater uh, near the equator. Um, storm surges will be greater. It just happens that there are hundreds of millions of people living in low-lying cities, um, places like Bangladesh, um, low-lying Pacific Islands that will be devastated. Uh, hundreds of millions of people displaced by that sea level increase. The temperature increase, although not as great as we will see in Canada, will kill more people um, in places where it, it's already difficult to survive very hot temperatures. Um, so, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, those are also the places that will be hit hardest by drought, where they're already not producing enough food in many cases to provide nutrition for the people who live there. And people in poor countries are more vulnerable to climate change by virtue of living in um, uh, less, uh, less secure dwellings, um, not having air conditioning and so on to protect them from heat waves. The, the photo here is the Philippine uh, lead climate uh, change negotiator who uh, was on uh, a hunger strike throughout the, the negotiations that just concluded. As early as 2000, a scientific study uh, estimated that there are 150,000 deaths per year already as a result of climate change. And what um, that will obviously get much, much greater as we increase the, the climate from a 0.65.7 C increase that we've experienced to date if we continue on our current trajectory to 4 C or more. What this figure shows is where people are dying. And the green are, you know, relatively low rates of mortality from climate change. Orange and red are where the impacts are being felt most significantly. So places where people are poor and vulnerable are being hardest hit. This next slide um, compares how much people in different countries have contributed and are contributing to global climate change and how much money we have. So the, uh, the second column is the uh, tons per year per person of CO2 being released. And we can see that the US and Canada, with annual emissions of 15 to 17 um, tons per year per person, have um, much, much higher emissions than those of, at the bottom, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the average person contributes 0.1 tons. And that's uh, averaging up. 
Um, the, the final column there is the GDP of those countries um, in U.S. dollars per person per year. Um, again, a contrast between Canada and the U.S. with $35,000 to $40,000 per person per year and the Democratic Republic of the Congo where the average person um, earns $150 per year. That's where people are going to be most affected by our actions. Um, you can also see the Philippines there, one ton per person per year, a 15th of what we release, um, and an average GDP per person of 1400 British Columbia, um, by virtue of having abundant hydropower, um, uh, has CO2 emissions slightly lower than the Canadian average, although still on the order of 10 tons per person per year. What this slide shows is um, a different way to think about British Columbia's impact on global climate change. The first column is the um, BC's own emissions, which the baseline for our policy 2007 was 67 um, million tons per year released in the province. Our goal is to re reduce that by a third by 2020. That would be to about 42 million tons per year. The final two columns is how much greenhouse gas emissions we are exporting in the form of fossil fuels. So already we are, in, we are exporting fossil fuels that will release three times as much as the emissions we're um, releasing within our province. And if all of the proposals go ahead for new mines, for coal exports, for bitumen pipelines, and for LNG, by 2020 that could increase to a factor of 10 times greater than our own emissions. And it's no accident that the countries that have the highest per capita emissions are wealthiest. We got wealthy by developing these resources by burning those fossil fuels. The International Energy Agency, which historically was a very conservative um, business-oriented body, itself has gotten, um, has been remarkably effective in sounding the alarm in the last few years. The most recent IEA report, um, those that came out this year, are saying we're desperately running out of time if we're gonna meet the two degrees Celsius limit on global climate change that um, scientists have recommended and that the international community has agreed to. If we're gonna meet that limit, two thirds of known fossil fuel reserves will have to be left in the ground. And when we talk about the most greenhouse gas intensive of those energy sources, thermal coal, more than 80% of that thermal coal will have to stay in the ground if we're, we're, if we're to have even a 50% chance of meeting a two degree Celsius limit on climate change. That has important implications for investment in new infrastructure. And this is one thing I find really frustrating is when the environmental community or academics speak out against new infrastructure projects, the argument is typically made they're against everything. Um, and, and I think that's not the case. Um, nobody is saying that we're gonna stop using all fossil fuels overnight. We have to obviously reduce that over time. But there are very important reasons to oppose new infrastructure investments. First of all, they're going in the wrong direction, increasing our ec coal exports instead of decreasing them. Secondly, they are locking us into a path of reliance on fossil fuels for many decades. Nobody builds a new project and then shuts it down two years later. And finally, we are directing our scarce resources to investments in new fossil fuel infrastructure instead of clean energy alternatives. Um, Frank already mentioned some things that have been going on in the US. Um, the US has been shifting from reliance on coal uh, to produce its electricity to increasingly relying on natural gas. And that has reduced significantly US greenhouse gas emissions. They are now at the lowest point in 18 years. If, however, that surplus coal that people in the Powder River and other uh, coal producing regions find themselves with makes its way to new and expanding energy markets in Asia and, and elsewhere, those gains in reducing US greenhouse gas emissions will be undone. Um, you've already seen a figure here. The, the point I would want to make is um, there are a number of different proposals. Some have already been withdrawn to export that surplus coal through US ports. It is much harder to build a US coal port in the US that it is in Canada. The requirements to conduct an environmental impact assessment are much more thorough, they're more extensive, uh, it takes a lot longer. Um, 
So if our neighbors to the south are successful in blocking several of those projects, um, and I do hope they will be, there will be increasing pressure to just keep that coal moving north and put it out through Canada. I don't believe that the Fraser Surrey Docks project would stop at four or eight million tons once we remove um, the Massey Tunnel and can get ocean-going uh, tankers right up to the port. Another element of this, this is a picture of my own son, Sam, speaking, um, is what we are handing to our children and our grandchildren when we invest in and continue to invest in this fossil fuel economy, which is basically um, a 19th century economy. It's not doing them a favor to either hand them a fossil fuel economy that will saddle them with climate change or hand them a fossil fuel economy at a time when the world actually gets its act together and starts weaning uh, itself from fossil fuels. And they're, they're stuck with these, um, the equivalent of handing them the keys to a buggy whip factory. So why are we, why is this process so screwed up? Um, and I've never encountered anything quite like this as a political scientist. Um, I've been trying to make sense of it. There are a number of different players. First, we've got local governments um, and governments such as Metro Vancouver, Surrey, Vancouver, many others have spoken out in opposition to these projects. The problem is they don't have the authority to block it. They can speak on our behalf, and that's been very important, but they can't um, stop it. The British Columbia government does have authority as well. BC's leadership on climate change has been rapidly evaporating, unfortunately. And when it comes to coal, the Premier and her ministers have been pretty happy to pass the buck to the feds and say, oh, this is a, this is a Port of Vancouver issue, it's federal. That is not entirely true. And the um, provincial authority is especially clear when it comes to um, the transfer facility at Texada Island. It is currently operating and is proposed to continue operating under a mining permit. It's not a mine. There once was a gravel mine there. It was never a coal mine, and a coal transfer facility is not a mine. Um, the independent uh, public health officers who are appointed by the provincial government are an exception, and they have been speaking out, uh, have been very power, a very powerful voice, and I think will continue to be so. This brings us to the feds. Federal government uh, has extensive authority over um, these matters through jurisdiction over international trade, um, uh, railroad lines, and um, federal ports. And the, the actor who has been delegated to exercise federal authority in this case is the Fraser River Port Authority. They like to call themselves Port Metro Vancouver. That is their brand. Um, and I think the problem, whoa, sorry. I'm so excited about the port. Um, the problem is the port is basically has a screwed up mandate. They have three quite distinct things that they're supposed to do and they're not compatible. The first is that they manage the federal government's public lands in the port. They, they own Canada Place Shopping Mall, for instance. They lease lands. Um, so they often call themselves a corporation. They're referred to as a crown corporation. They're not a crown corporation at all. Um, they talk about their customers, which I find particularly troubling because they are not a corporation. They do rely entirely for their operations on funds that are raised through leases and operation of their businesses, such as Canada Place. So that's function one. Function two is a traditional regulatory role of coordinating the users of the port, basically making sure everyone's got access to the shipping lanes and the ships don't run into each other. And consistent with that, the, the, um, the body that governs the port, they are appointed by federal cabinet. Our um, majority of them are nominated by the industries that use the port. So on the, the board of directors of the port is someone who previously was on the board of directors of the Coal Association of Canada. And the idea is that you know, they can work out who gets equal access. That becomes particularly problematic when we turn to the third function of the port, which is to protect the public's interest, including protecting public health and, um, and the environment. And there, there's a tension between the third function and both of the other ones. There's a tension with the first one because why would the port say no to a project that they rely on financially to maintain their own operations? It was deeply troubling that when we submitted access to information requests, I'm out of time. Okay, I'm gonna go really fast. Um, 
You've probably been doing that for a long time, Gail, and I didn't even notice. Um, when we submitted access to information requests to the port, um, they, they redacted a lot of the material because they had a financial interest in these regulatory matters. There's a tension, obviously, between um, having a board that is um, nominated by the industries that use the port and a responsibility for regulating the environmental impacts of those industries. So they are biased by design. I think there's still a lot we can do about that. In my um, comparative work as a political scientist, the only thing that ever makes a difference, and it can, yes, it can make a difference even with conservative governments, is the electorate. They report to us, they don't, you know, they don't have to come back uh, except every few years and I think politicians have been very nervous about taking long-term positions, taking positions that can be depicted as contrary to economic development because they don't trust that we'll back them up. And I think the only solution is for us to speak out in very large numbers and say that we will back them up and this is what we want. And I don't know about you, but I feel like the Canadian government and the positions they've been taking in Warsaw and on the international stage doesn't represent the Canadians that I know. Um, and they certainly don't speak for our children and our grandchildren's generation either, and I think we have to tell them that. Thank you.